I have an extraordinary sense of humor. I was a one of three children, and I just want you to please understand what that means. When you're a middle child, you're nowhere. You're expected to listen to your sister, who's a princess, who's number one, and a brother, who's number three. I said something remarkable at an early age to my sister. If you are all of that, then why am I here? She ran to her mother complaining, I don't like him. But I'd like to be here tonight to tell you something remarkable about what I do for a living. Cross-culturally, there's no type of physician that sees more patients of different cultures, races, and ethnicity than those that treat patients with diabetes. It's the holy grail. It's a connecting glue for all of us in what we do. For this talk tonight, and this is an original talk, I put this together just for you. I had to do some thinking about concepts that I've worked with. I published a journal article, I hope that you have the link to tonight, in a journal of the National Medical Association. I was asked to do the editorial um, a dozen years ago in 2010. That's appropriate for tonight's talk. I would like you to look at that link of cultural competency because we served as a framework for our discussion tonight. And though we had high hopes for a lot of changes, a lot of changes still to come in terms of how we treat our patients, how the patients are treated by us, how we perceive our patients, looking at demographics, looking at social determinants of health. But a big part of our talk tonight will be about structural racism. We have to accept from whom we are, we have to accept our limitations, our biases, cultural, religious, racial, and beyond. This talk will speak about our concerns in patient care. I'm pleased to have a patient of my practice, Alicia Brown, sitting here in the front row. Give her a hand. I was putting the talk together and I was thinking to myself, how can I make this most impactful? And Alicia comes into the practice to tell us a story that you'll hear. I want you to listen carefully to her story because the story is the talk. The talk will complement what you see and what she brings to the table. The title of today's talk is simply this, Doctor, Do You Care About Me? This is something told to me many years ago by a friend who is Hispanic physician on the border of Mexico in Texas. There is a state called Texas, right? Well, he has taught me a lot by this statement. I thought I would use it for today's talk. Now, I'd like to get the slides going here. And the remote was working wonderfully earlier. And what am I doing wrong with this? I'll have this fixed in a moment. But what you need more than anything to know is to listen to what we have to say going forward. It looks like it's structurally correct. Let's try it again. Is it moving the slides? Technology is wonderful, but remember, technology is man-made. For the women in the audience, you can do better than this. I was brought up by a mother who taught me that to be careful about statements about the senses. This was working all 15, 20 minutes ago. What you want to know from tonight's talk is how can I go on a hospital ward? How can I do the right thing and be the right type of physician for the right types of patients? To be culturally sensitive, to be good listeners. So once again, doctor, do you care about me? More importantly, are you listening to me? This is our video. Hi, I'm Dr. Anthony Cannon. I'm a clinical endocrinologist at Cooper Care Alliance, part of Cooper University Healthcare in South Jersey. I'm here to present to you a patient of mine who has the most impactful and descriptive series of interactions in the medical system that I think would be useful to those of us who are healthcare providers, to patients, and particularly to those in training in medical school and residency about how we interact with our patients and how our patients perceive those interactions. 
and how indelible those interactions are in the psyche of the patient, even years later after the experience. We're going to introduce now our patient, and we'll focus on what she has to say. There are several questions I'm going to ask of her. I think you'll be as impressed as I have been with her story. Hi, my name is Alicia Brown, and I'm a type 1 diabetic. Our first question, Alicia, is describe the symptoms you experienced prior to the life-changing hospitalization that you recently had. Leading up to my diagnosis, I remember feeling really, really tired. Um, but my diet hadn't changed, so I just didn't understand why I wasn't able to move um, the way I had been all these years. And um, I remember losing a lot of weight, or rather my mom told me that I lost a lot of weight. And I wasn't convinced because, you know, this is during the pandemic. I'm wearing leggings and sweatpants. To me, my clothes still fit. Um, after she urged me to get on the scale, I noticed the difference in my weight, um, which was scary. But I wrote my fatigue off as, you know, stress from work. Um, I'd always been slightly anemic, so again, I didn't think much of it. It wasn't until I went to work out um, and I couldn't keep up in my Zumba class. I was missing steps, and this was just not like me. A um, couple days prior to going into the hospital, I remember being really thirsty and just having to go to the bathroom a lot, but again, not ever connecting the dots and thinking that I was diabetic. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you describe as work? What do you do with your day? So my nine to five, I work in communications and PR. So a lot of writing, a lot of checking in with clients, a lot of managing messaging um, for several accounts. In addition to that, I am also a doctoral candidate. So my evenings are spent working on my research, um, something that I hope to finish really soon. And where is that at? I am studying at Drexel University School of Education. Tell me more about your family history with respect to diabetes. Uh, to my knowledge, there is no known history of diabetes in my family. Uh, my parents are not diabetic, my grandparents or great-grandparents. Mm -hmm. So getting the diagnosis um, of type 1 was a shocker to me. Um, a, a true gut punch, <laughs> if you will. When you arrived at the emergency room, can you describe your interactions with the professional staff, including doctors and nurses at the outside hospital? Um, well, prior to arriving to the emergency room, I actually went to urgent care. And the nurse practitioner um, that was on staff ran through a, a bunch of tests. Um, and she came back into the room and she said, Alicia, I'm shocked at your diagnosis, given that you don't have any family history. So she told me to follow up with the, you know, go to the emergency room uh, for further evaluation. When I arrived, I mean, I sat in, in the emergency room for several hours. And once I was taken back to see the physician and nurses, the first thing the physician said to me when he walked in was, what did you do to get here? Did you stretch your insulin? Did you eat too many carbs this weekend? And I remember being one too tired to argue with him, um, but also shocked that that was the initial question, conversation. It was, felt like more of a, an accusation. Like I didn't do what I needed to do to take care of myself. Um, and after a deep breath, I corrected him and said, this is my first time. Um, I was told by urgent care that I am in the middle of my first diabetic episode. Um, so there was no insulin to stretch. I am still trying to understand why I'm here. I think it's important to recognize that you had diabetic ketoacidosis and that you were in a life-threatening circumstance by laboratory data and by clinical presentations. I want to put this in perspective for those of you who are listening to this presentation. You were quite ill. 
enough so that you need an immediate hospitalization and immediate attention to a diagnosis you have not experienced before. Share what you were told regarding the diagnosis of diabetes. Include information about the treatment plan offered during that hospitalization. Um, after the physician and the nurses ran additional tests, um, basically <coughs> confirming what the nurse practitioner um, had, you know, basically confirming the results that the nurse practitioner had earlier. Um, I was told that I was going to be admitted and that I could expect to be here for, in the hospital for at least three days. That test would continue and that I would be administered insulin. It was very, very high level um, and not very, not very direct. Um, and also, it was really hard to hear that doctor and listen to him after, you know, being accused of stretching my insulin and all that. The, the trust was broken. So everything kind of sounded like, you know, Charlie Brown's teacher, you know, that womp womp um, whenever he talked. So um, I was admitted to ICU. And the only person that came in and had a conversation with me about what was going on and what I could expect and actually brought me a packet of information that was about this thick on what type 1 um, is and how to, you know, maintain or what my diet would look like moving forward um, was a nurse that worked the evening shift. Not one doctor had a conversation with me or took the time to explain really what was going to happen next. Well, how did the team assigned to your care educate you about this di diagnosis of type 1 diabetes? They, the team that um, was responsible for my care, again, just handed me a booklet, which I read through on my own. Um, and then I waited in the evening for that one nurse who worked the overnight shift um, to ask her questions. Considering your hospitalization in the intensive care unit, was a di with di diagnosis of diabetic ketoacidosis. Tell us about the education you received from the endocrinologist assigned to your care. The education that I received from my endocrinologist that was assigned to me was not much different than what was shared with me in the hospital. Um, she basically went down a checklist. Do you know what type 1 is? How many carbs are you eating each day? Are you dividing them up equally between meals? Are you eating heavier carbs in the morning? Do you plan to have kids? Um, because if you do, then your treatment plan might change. But based on your numbers, it looks like you are fine um, maintaining on Lantus. I'll see you in a couple weeks. Was there any discussion about the involvement from a team approach with a dietitian? or other people that could assist you with your new diagnosis of type 1 diabetes mellitus. And this is within a few days of leaving the hospital, right? So uh, within a few days of leaving the hospital, I did meet with the endocrinologist, and she said that meeting with a diabetic educator would be helpful. Um, scheduling that appointment was very, very difficult. Um, one, because there was limited availability, and this was during COVID, so very few people were answering the phones. I did not see um, an educator, a nutritionist, until two years after my diagnosis. Wow. When you left the hospital, what did they actually tell you about your disease state beyond setting up an appointment with the endocrinology group? Was there a discharge plan that asked you questions to ask you, did you understand your diagnosis? Did you understand what you would have to do and how to do it? I, I didn't get a sense of that in our initial presentation, but I missed something there. Um, the day that I was discharged, a nurse um, came into my room and showed me how to use my glucometer, how I would administer insulin and I was given the paperwork and told to follow up with my primary care and make an appointment with the endocrinologist because they weren't able to visit me in hospital. Another question, throughout your experience, share how your concerns were addressed and how you were included in the decision-making process related to management of your medical illness. 
Um, since my diagnosis, I did not feel that my providers at the time included me in decision making for you know, my treatment plan and what made sense for me. Uh, one thing that I've always maintained is that, yes, I'm type one, but I'm not your typical type one. Um, I still work out, you know, I've played sports, I've always been active. Um, I enjoy food, you know, I, I still eat cake <laughs> from time to time. Um, but all in all, I am disciplined and I've always taken my health uh, very seriously. So when I conveyed this to my doctors and said, I can maintain the healthy diet, the exercise, I was immediately told that that was not sustainable and that I would be on an insulin pump before I knew it. What was your reaction to that? My reaction to hearing that was, this is not supportive. Um, it was hurtful. I did not feel like anybody that I had worked with at the time, the endocrinologist, the nurse practitioner, the diabetic educator, I did not feel like anybody was on my side um, and that anybody was really too ready or wanting to work on a plan with me. Um, I was told that, and this was from the endocrinologist, if I can't maintain a low carb, carb diet, you can't. Um, and those words were wild to me because I am not her and she is not me. Um, I am unique in every way and my care plan should be just that. And that was not what I was, was receiving or had received um, with that provider. One final question. How could healthcare teams create positive experiences for patients who find themselves in situations like this? Healthcare teams can create positive situations for patients um, by making them feel seen and heard. Okay, I was prepared, you know, to have a conversation with my previous provider, and she tuned me out. And that that just does not make for <laughs> a great relationship moving forward. So it's really important that providers hear their patients, see them. And look beyond the numbers. Don't look at that chart and say, okay, you're, you're doing terribly. Ask what led up to that. Um, and also connect with other specialists within the network. I mean, it's really, really important for, you know, your primary care to speak to your specialist um, prior to leaving <laughs> Um, this other healthcare network, I did have a primary care physician that was well connected and she followed up with my endocrinologist. So I did feel like I had somebody on the team. Um, but once she left that practice, there was nobody to um, help with coordinating that care and keeping that line of communication open. Um, so in order to, you know, do what's best for the patient, create a space for them to be seen and heard. I'd like to thank you for your amazing story. Um, I've heard it in part before, but this is very impactful and very worrisome in a healthcare environment where we have all the technology in the world, all the king's horses, but not all the king men and women to do the right thing. Thank you very much for your time this morning. <coughs>
send there from urgent care, expecting the cavalry to find anything but the cavalry. A callousness, a lack of empathy, plain bias. Let's talk about bias. The American Heart Association has come up with a presidential advisory in the year 2020, which will be what I call a call to action, referencing the role of structural racism and its role as a driver of health disparities. And this is what we're going to talk about tonight. I'm going to be to the point. I've been in practice for 34 years. I've seen this behavior. I'm intolerant of this behavior. From Eddie Murphy's statement. I'm gumpy, damn it. I am tired of people being treated like this. I tap people on the shoulder and ask them to repeat what they say to others to make them understand how they sound to others. This is something in your training you're going to do, and you're going to do it more forcefully than I'm doing it today, because with time, you're going to be gumby too. The realization is we live in a multicultural environment. We have to be culturally sensitive and understanding the wishes of other people and not just our own internal biases. This particular presidential advisory was as powerful as anything I read in the preparations for this talk. Here are the definitions. There will be a quiz in the morning because there always is. You have to understand terminology before you can take an examination. Health disparities, a particular type of health difference that is closely linked with social, economic, and environmental disadvantage. Health disparities adversely affect groups of people who have systematically experienced greater obstacles to health base on their, their racial or ethnic group or other characteristics historically linked to discrimination or exclusion. A health inequity is it's systematic differences in the health status of different population groups. These inequities have significant social and economic costs to both the individuals and societies. Other things I want to talk about tonight, racism. We have to define racism for what it is. There's internalized racism, acceptance by members of the stigmatized races of negative messages about their own abilities and intrinsic worth. Institutional racism, differential access to the goods, services, and opportunities of society by race, and most importantly, structural racism, which I'll get back to, the normalization and legitimization of an array of dynamics, historical, cultural, institutional, and interpersonal, that routinely advantage white people while producing cumulative and chronic adverse outcomes for people of color. Social determinants of health, Social determinants of health are the conditions in the environment where people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health functioning and quality of life outcomes and risk. Socioeconomic positioning, an aggregate concept that includes both material and social resources, such as income, wealth, educational credentials, and one's rank in a social hierarchy. Conceptualization as access and consumption of goods, services, and knowledge as linked to both childhood and adult social class position. These are the terms that you need to know tonight. Let's get back to structural racism. It refers to the normalization and legitimization of an array of dynamic, historical, cultural, institutional, interpersonal that routinely advantage white people while producing cumulative and cumulative and chronic adverse outcomes for people of color. Structural racism leads to different access to the goods, services, and opportunities of society by race. Determines societal values and power hierarchies and underlies persistent health disparities. Structural racism concentrates power among privileged groups and devalues populations whose health needs need to be equitably improved, in particular Black Americans, who are also subject to the ills of anti-Black racism. The intersection between social determinants of health and disparities by race and ethnicity is rooted in structural racism that results in uneven access to quality schools, paying jobs, higher incomes, wealth accumulation, better neighborhoods, health insurance, and quality medical care. We'll look at a database that was presented 
um, in this paper, looking at 2007 to 2017, age-adjusted total cardiovascular mortality rates by race and ethnicity. To speak about diabetes, we have to speak about the overarching umbrella. Where you have diabetes, you have high blood pressure. Where you have high blood pressure, you have hypercholesterolemia. Where you have the three together, you have cardiovascular disease. As a cardiology model, look at these numbers. In each of these groups over a 10 year time period, you see a relative age adjusted decrease in the deaths per 100,000. But look at the where the African Americans are. Even though it's been an 18.1% reduction, look from whence they come and where they arrive. They are by far the highest risk group for end stage heart disease, myocardial infarctions, strokes, um, and the like. And this is really well demarcated. It's probably the only slide I can show you looking at multiple racial groups in a comparative way. Not Hispanic whites, not Hispanic blacks, Hispanics, Alaska Native American Indians, and non Hispanic Asian Pacific Islanders. There is no data in the literature that has all these groups listed like this. You can put in perspective the morbidity and mortality, particularly the mortality from this database, of the risk of Black Americans. A review of the historical context would be incomplete without noting a mistrust and poor relationships caused by misdeeds conducted in the United States in the name of science and clinical care. Examples from a long list of the U.S. Public Health Service syphilis study at Tuskegee. We all know about that, right? Does anybody have any idea how long that went on? 40 years, 30 years beyond penicillin's discovery. Who for thought? Tertiary syphilis and death of individuals unnecessarily. We also have other issues like the Native American women, which we were sterilizing right through the 1970s. On your right, my right, we talk about slavery. We talk about structures of racism from that time period, post-emancipation structure of racism to, main, to maintain white privilege. That's what Jim Crow laws were about, segregating, redlining, targeting black people. We have biases in the justice system, as you'll see. We have concentrated poverty as a result and social determinants of health, poor access to care we spoke of earlier, poor housing, poorly funded schools, and poor access to capital, most importantly. These factors lead into what we call a toxic, stressful situation where the violence and the problems in the inner cities and equivalent areas of the country. We also have increased cardiovascular risk and stroke risk because of habits that are not the best. We have increased burden of cardiovascular disease and poor cardiovascular outcome and stroke outcome. Does this not make sense when you look at this data? Look at the groups at highest risk and look at where they've come from. Though all of the groups have benefited, the groups are disparate in terms of their baseline cardiovascular risk. It's based on this modeling. Probably the best article I can show you from an endocrine perspective is casting a healthy uh, equity lens on endocrinology and diabetes written by Golden et al. This was a really major pop, uh, publication and eye opening um, done out of John Hopkins and elsewhere. And basically this article speaks about this. It refines what I just showed you. We look at historically discriminate, historical discrimination and racism during slavery and post-Civil War. But we get into more details. Look at the medical side. My left, medical and science contributors, the concept of eugenics, our theories defining cer certain races being superior to others, closure of medical schools. Does anybody know how many black medical schools there were in America before the Flexner Report? Do you know the Flexner Report, 1910? That was a watershed. It closed five of the seven black medical schools for the sake of improvement of health care. In retrospect, those five programs were no worse or better than others that were allowed to stay open. There's been a decrease in trust in the medical establishment. There have been healthcare provider biases towards minority patients. Language and communication barriers, we speak about those all the time. Poor access to care, quality of care, health literacy all down. The stresses, the blood pressures, the obesity, the cholesterol, the blood glucose, the lung diseases all go up. And we have disparate health outcomes, and we look at this as diabetes, obesity, heart disease, and hypertension. On the opposite side are the social conditions that feed into this. Our redlining, our predatory lending institutions, our discrimination and access to high quality jobs and the like, leading to structural and institutional racism. There's an environmental context which increases poverty, 
mass incarceration, increase in issues of lack of employment and adequate lifestyles. If we were to look at the physical context, we've seen neighborhoods that are unstable, lack of open spaces and affordable housing. We've included on this slide the offense of COVID-19, which had a disproportional negative effect on racial minorities, particularly Latinos and African Americans, based on these neighborhood issues, societal issues, and the stresses in these uh, domains. We couldn't get public health infectious disease help to these people because they were often first liners and they themselves were returning to neighborhoods where there was crowding and spread of the infection. Again, leading to disparate health outcomes. The most fabulous book ever written on diabetes from a racial perspective was just published in 2020 out of Vanderbilt. The chairman of, his, of the history department, uh, Arlene Tuckman, wrote a seminal uh, book that really does give us in, uh, insight into everything I just told you. These are her quotes. When diabetes first emerged as a public health concern in the 19th century, it had a highly specific racial profile that linked the disease most frequently to whites in general and Jews in particular. Those populations no longer dominate the accounts we read of diabetes in professional journals and the popular press. African Americans, Hispanic, Native Americans, and Asian Americans have now replaced Jews and whites as the races most likely to develop diabetes, even as the meaning of race remains highly ambiguous and contested. She goes on to say, American obsession with race, but not racism, and ambivalence towards class have been reinforced historically by the government's tendency to collect information about race and ethnicity when conducting health studies and to neglect other confounding factors such as class. This partial telling of the story is consistently reproduced on government websites designed to disseminate important information about diseases to the public. Thus, materials about diabetes on the websites of the NIH CDC informs readers that membership in certain racial and ethnic groups place them at high risk of developing diabetes, while saying nothing about the risk of living in economically depressed inner city neighborhoods and rural areas, or of encountering racism regularly. In this way, the picture that governs that the government organizations produce and reproduce of populations at risk for diabetes is at best misleading, and at worst, evidence of how government messages can inadvertently reinforce structural racism by masking racial stereotypes within seemingly factual claims. Bingo, 1985. This was when I joined the American Diabetes Association, finishing my fellowship at that time. And this was the poster everywhere in our fellowship room and our fellowship location in Temple, Diabetes Favorite Minorities. These are the type of statements that are made, but they don't tell you how we got there. Why all of a sudden are racial minorities being looked upon as having the highest prevalence of this disease state? It's because we really haven't looked at the social determinants of health and structural racism. National diabetes statistics, I'm gonna put this in perspective for you. This is gonna be a quiz in the morning. One in five Americans now have diabetes. This is the newest data from 2020. Um, actually, 2022, I updated it this morning. 37.3 million Americans have diabetes, and one in five don't even know it. From 2001 to 2020, diabetes prevalence significantly increased amongst U.S. adults 18 and older. Over 37 million people have diabetes. That's 11.3% of the U.S. population. 28.7 million have been diagnosed. 8.5 million people who have been who have diabetes diagnosis. 8.5 million people who have diabetes have not been diagnosed. And in the African American, 50% of African Americans are walking around without knowledge that they have diabetes. The total pre diabetes market is 96 million. 26.4 million adults over 65 years and older have pre diabetes. Food for thought. There is no family that you would know of that is not impacted at some time, some way by type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes based on this data. So look at the cost centers. In 2017, the cost was estimated to be 327 billion, 237 billion in direct medical costs, and 90 billion in lost productivity. Look at the excess medical costs associated with diabetes. Ask any employer. Per individual is $9,601 on an annual basis as of 2017, higher now. 
above what an employee would have for other disease status. So let's look at the ethnicity issue very quickly. Um, the highest group for any board exam you take is American Indian Alaska Native, 14.5%. Uh, Much of that data is driven by the Pima Indians, where up to 50 to 60% of the population are diabetic. Um, Asian, not Hispanic, 9.5%. Emphasizing Black, not Hispanic at 12.1, and Hispanics at 11.8. But the comparator is the white, non Hispanic population, which is 7.4%. So how race and ethnicity affects diabetes prevalence um, from Diatribe's uh, publication looking at management and complications of diabetes? This is a statement that I think is very telling. Compared to white individuals, Hispanic blacks, and Asian individuals received fewer diabetes management checks, including A1C tests, eye exams, foot exams, blood cholesterol tests, and flu backs. Even in adjusted models, which control the factors like life insurance coverage, poverty, and education, some of the disparities remained. Most notably, Hispanic Blacks and Asian individuals were less likely to receive the two recommended annual A1C checks. The researchers showed that, the difference, that this difference in quality of care occurred partly because populations of color had less access to health insurance and diabetes management education compared to white populations. But remember, they said, partly because there are other factors. Trends in care translates to trends in diabetes outcomes, including complications and death rate. A study from 2014 looked into racial and ethnic differences in diabetes complications and mortality. Black, indigenous, and Hispanic individuals have higher rates of retinopathy and stage kidney disease and amputations than non-Hispanic white individuals. Furthermore, these groups are more likely to die from diabetes than non-Hispanic whites. Indigenous populations were three times more likely to die from diabetes. Non-Hispanic Black Americans were 2.3 times more likely to die from diabetes. Hispanic Americans 1.5 times more likely to die from diabetes. Just as with the risk of diabetes, people of color are not genetically predisposed to diabetes-related complications due to race alone. That's the gut looks like. Data, data, data. Income, un unemployment, and health insurance, and food and exercise. In the U.S., there are major racial differences in wealth. A Kaiser study in 2018 offered this breakdown of people living below the federal poverty line. One in four indigenous people, one in five black people, one in five Hispanics, and one in ten whites. Got milk? Unemployment and health insurance. People of color in America are more likely to be unemployed. According to U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, the rates of unemployment in 2019 broke down by race were 6.6% of indigenous people, 6.1% of black people, 3.9% of Latino and Hispanic people, and 3.1% whites. And finally, food and exercise. A healthy diet and regular exercise are known to reduce the risk and improve the outcomes of type 2 diabetes. However, black, Hispanic, and indigenous communities in the U.S. have less access to healthy food and experience higher rates of food insecurity, food deserts than white communities. According to USDA, more than 35 million people live in food insecure households in the United States in 2019, including 25%, 25%, one in four indigenous people, 19.1% from non-Hispanic black households, 15.6% of Hispanic households, and 7.9% of non-Hispanic white households. Social determinants of health, unhealthy outcomes, Health disparities. The high cost of health care means that those who are uninsured or underinsured often do not get the care they need, including preventative health care, such as annual checkups and pre diabetes screening, and instead must rely on inconsistent care. How do you spell inconsistent care? The local emergency room, right? Unfortunately, Black, Indigenous, and Hispanic people are less likely to be insured in America. Again, according to Kaiser, of non elderly individuals in the U.S. These were the rates of uninsured people in 2018. 21.8% of indigenous people identified as American Indian or Alaska Native, 19.9% of Hispanic people, 11.5% of black people, and 7.5% for the white population. And what I was trying to add didn't come through. Even when people are corrected for having insurance, the cost of diabetes care and a diabetes-friendly nutrition plan can be challenging for people with low incomes. 
social and racial barriers widen diabetes health disparities. There is a history of prejudice against people of color in our healthcare system. Can I say that again? Social and racial barriers widen diabetes health disparities. Blaming the victim. There is a history of prejudice against people of color in our healthcare system. Black, indigenous, and Hispanic individuals can have the same income, insurance, and medical conditions as white people, yet still receive lower quality care due to systemic racism. In 2018, fewer than 12% of practicing physicians in the United States were black, Hispanic, or indigenous individuals. This means that there are fewer healthcare professionals who can earn trust and identify with communities of color. Let's talk about a mechanism of hope. I'm going to get into something really quickly because we're running out of time. There are three major studies that you should listen up to. The Turner Report under Lyndon Baines Johnson, 1967, with the burning of Detroit and the burning of Newark, where over 60 people lost their lives for violence in those inner cities, came out with the statement that we brought this upon ourselves. We being white America brought this upon ourselves, that the amount of intense poverty and hopelessness. What's the opposite of hope? Is it hopelessness? No, it's despair. We had nothing to lose. Many people lost their lives, but nine out of 10 people that died in those two cities were of those neighborhoods. One in 10 were law enforcement agents were ill-trained to deal with the rioting, both at the national level, the National Guard and the local police. So we have to look at that study and we have to look forward at the, besides the Kerner report, the Heckler report under um, the auspices of Ronald Reagan, who was surprised by the secretary's work at HHS, Health and Human Services, who came out and set up this discussion about the social determinants of health. It's a language from her committee that led to the improvements later on with Obamacare. Obamacare in 2010 was another step in the right direction to define health inequities and to make the health disparities better. What they did, they allowed people to have insurance, they allowed people to have self-worth. And though there's, there's political consequences of such movements, we've improved the health care of those on the low end such as socioeconomic wealth of this country in ways that I cannot describe by data alone. Part of that same process came from culturally and linguistically appropriate services. This really was from the Heckler Report and forwarded by a, a Obamacare program. We set standards calling for the recruitment and promoting of diverse and inclusive workforce to achieve health equity. So this is uplifting. According to 2018 data from the American Association of Medical College, only 10.5% of endocrinologists, again, 126 of internists identified from these racial groups. These figures are startling given the high prevalence of diabetes in this population, as we discussed. Thus, the two specialists, specialties caring for the majority of patients with diabetes lack a physician workforce reflecting this diverse population. So we came out with standards of care. We're going to look to principal standards to provide effective, equitable, and understandable, respectful quality care and services that are responsive to diverse cultural health beliefs and practices is one. We're going to have better governance. We're going to advance and sustain organizational governance and leadership that promotes class and health equity through policy, practices, and allocation of resources. Communication language assistance. This is something that we all see in the clinic now. Where I am at Cooper, we have enough reserve in our bank to speak 35 different languages. I got this one. I have people coming from around the world. I can speak to them in their language. Offer language assistance to individuals who have limited English proficiency and or other communication needs at no cost to them. This is what we do. Engagement, continuous improvement and accountability, establish culturally and linguistically uh, appropriate goals, policies, and management accountability. I can go on and on. These are laudable goals, which we, we're falling somewhat short of, but we have at least made some inroads in these areas. But the statement I want to leave you with tonight, on behalf of people living with diabetes and other endocrine disorders, members of our specialty must become advocates for social policies that support environmental justice as necessary for the attainment of health equity through partnerships with the government affairs offices and our local academic institutions such as this one, 
an endocrine society, which I belong to, advocacy, which I belong to as well. We can support the development of legislation to address housing and food insecurity, lack of access to physical activity options and job insecurity so that everyone can attain their highest level of health. Our future statement should be something like this. To achieve health act equity, we must first name and identify structural racism in places it exists. And then challenge and dismantle the structural racism that shapes upstream governance and social structures and policies that perpetuate ideologies of superiority over historically marginalized populations and perpetuate persistent disparities. Future policies and interventions must be implemented at the individual, community, and population levels to achieve equitable access to social and economic resources that enhance health equity for all historically disenfranchised groups.